uh, you create a. Oops. Oh, Sorry, can you hear go me? Ahead. Yeah. All right. All right. From the top. So no. <laughs> so with um, with light, right? So it, light goes through any crystalline structure. It's gonna it's gonna fracture, and that's where we get different colors from. So you've probably seen the old um, Pink Floyd. Uh, album cover where there's white light going through a triangle of um, glass or diamond or whatever it is, crystal and structure, and then it comes out as like a rainbow. You guys seen that, Carlos? Have you seen that? Yeah, isn't that pretty much Isaac Newton as well? I mean, um, I don't know who founded that. Who founded that theory? I'm not sure, but it's you know you think about it. So this light, when filtered through a crystal, becomes all these different colors. And now this is like everybody's saying, well, my truth, my light is this kind of indigo color here. Well, my light is this yellow over here. My light is red. So the interesting thing is it's all light. It all looks different because it's gone through a prism, but at the same uh, prism filter, but at the same time, it's all the exact light, but none of it is pure. None of it is pure unless it's unfiltered light. Unfiltered light is just bright. Even for those who, who study like I, I study it, but I don't always believe, I don't believe in it, but like my brother, he's really big into the chakra points of the human body, oddly enough, that follows up with the Kabbalistic views of it as well. It's interesting. Um, but that the purest aura or vibe, right? So when people say like, oh, I love your vibe, it's like the new cool thing to say, I guess. What they're actually saying is your vibration of electromagnetism in your body, which is light. They're saying, what color is your light? And the highest point of spirituality in that, in that type of faith is white. What's interesting is purest light is white. That's what it is. Unfiltered pure light is white. When light slows down, it becomes blue. And that's why, uh, uh, I'm sorry, when it slows down, it becomes red. So sunsets are red, orange, yellow, because that is light slowed down because it's on the other side of the earth. When light is sped up, it's blue and green. And that's why when, when the sun first comes up, it's almost like a blue green in the, in the sky, right? So everyone says, why is it kind of just clear in the afternoon? But then in the beginning of the day, everything has a blue hint to it. And at the night, everything has a red hint to it. That's because light sped up is blue, light slowed down is red. But in its purity, it is white. So even in these faiths and cultures and ideas and the chakra things and the auras and the Kabbalism, the purest is white, unfiltered light. So though everyone might have their own perception, somebody's perception of love is this man being married, quote, end quote, to this man over here, a homosexual relationship. And to them, they truly believe that this is love. This is light. This is warmth. This is what God wants or not God wants for their life. And maybe they're feeling a correct emotion, but in an uncorrect situation. For some guy, I had a really, some guy will say, I had a really bad day, but once I had seven beers, man, my day was better. Okay, so he's feeling at peace, he's feeling shalom, but in an unrighteous, un incorrect situation. So everybody in the most evil things, they are actually seeking pure goodness. They really aren't. I don't believe there's a single human behavior that is not backed by a positive thing. A man who is stealing food is because he's hungry. Being hungry and eating is a good, righteous thing. He's doing it in an incorrect way. So everybody's going to have a piece. Every faith has a little piece. Every person, human, no matter how, how ungodly they are, they have a little piece of something good. But it's filtered through their own lens their own rose-colored glasses, because in its pure form, light has one direction, and it is the Torah. The Torah is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light. What, that's what David says. The Torah is the light that shows us how to walk. People have their own versions of, of religion and their own versions of happiness and love. It's a piece of it, but it is through that filter. They're getting one color, out, and all the colors mixed together are not brown or, or black, it's white. They all cancel each other out, so pure light is white. Does that make sense? So people have their perspective truth, and there is some truth to it, because there's not a human on this planet that doesn't seek love, security, 
emotional and physical fulfillment. There's not a single human who does not seek those things one way or another. Yeah, makes sense. How, how they do it? Well, follow the direct of light, follow the Torah. It's called the way, the truth. Well, Yeshua says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He's, he's life. He's light. He's, he's all these things. It's, um, it all goes together, right? Torah, Yeshua, same thing in my book. Uh, light, it's all the same thing. Yeshua's hanging out with Moshe and Eliyahu. He turns around and Yeshua it says, even his clothes are bright and white. And Peter's like, let's go make some tents. It's probably Sukkot. That's probably why Peter's like, let's make some three tents. But yeah, Yeshua um, is the path. And then he shows us the path as well. Yep. Yeah, he is and he reveals. And therefore his Talmudim, us, his disciples, should also reveal we are not the path. Do not file, follow Michael Shoning, please. Follow me only as I as I reveal Yeshua who reveals the Father. I, I do some dumb stuff. I do some, I've done some things in my life I am not proud of. I've done some things that I will not have any of my disciples copy if it's if within my will, right? But there are things in my life I'm like, please do this. And some of them are they're behavioral. It's not just stay away from pork. It's don't be unloving. Don't be a gamma ray to those around you who eat pork. Lead them with love. We, we had a, we've done foster care for six years and, and therapeutic level. It's a psychological level of foster care. And we had a girl and, and um, we visited her in Portland. No, she came to Colorado and visited us. We used to live in Oregon. And she said, um, just want to let you know, you know, I moved out of your house seven years ago. She's 22 now. And she said, I, uh, I just want to let you know, I still keep Shabbat and keep kosher. And we said, you live with, you don't live with us for seven years. Why would you choose to do that? She said, well, you guys ate kosher. You guys eat kosher and you keep Shabbat and you loved me. So I just subconsciously associated love with kosher and Shabbat and people who keep kosher and Shabbat are loving people. And I want to be a loving person. And at that moment, I realized what a light truly was. We never forced her to keep Shabbat and kosher. Through, through DHS, you can't force any religious observance on your kids. I can't. All I can do is be a light. That's it. And not the firecracker kind of light where I'm using guilt and shame to make people do what I want. And I'm loud about it. It's a candle. It's a shamash candle in the center of the, of the menorah. It's, the, it's that light that is gentle and loving. And seven years later, this girl who had all the freedoms in the world to break Shabbat and, and eat pork and whatever associated our love with those things, with Torah keeping. That is what a light is. If we are the, the happiest, most joyous, loving people in town, people will want Torah. But because historically the Messianic and Hebraic Hebraic Roots community has not been loving, has not been a good useful light in the community, it has damaged our movement to the core. We are, I believe, around 3 million right now globally. We were 30 people in the 70s. Early 2000s, we were uh, actually 2000, I think 10, I counted only about 350,000 people globally. We're now over 3 million. The messianic movement is growing like crazy, but there's still not people knocking our doors down every Shabbat morning. There's still a lot of small congregations. There's still a lot of challenge. But people are not challenging our observances as much as they are challenging our love. If we had Torah and Yeshua in the way that God intended and that beautiful balance between grace and law, we would be the happiest, most loving, most passionate, kindest people on this planet. We would make Buddhist monks look like bad guys. We would make them look grumpy. If we truly, if we truly allowed God's light to exude through us in our daily walk, in the grocery store, what is wrong with this guy? He's like singing on a Monday. He's smiling on a Monday in the grocery. Is this guy nuts? Why is, I want what he has. That's what a light is. It's not a guy behind a megaphone telling everybody they're going to hell if they celebrate Christmas and eat bacon. It is the fruits of the spirit that draw people to Yeshua, that, who, who draws people to the Father. And like I said, if, if we truly understood what it meant 
to be Torah pursuant. I don't, I don't like Torah keeping or Torah obedient because we don't have a temple. We don't have a priesthood. So like, like out of the 613, the average male in America today could do about 210, 212. So anyways, we're, we're trying, we're Torah trying, <laughs> we're trying, right? Yeah, it's like, a, put it. yeah. So uh, I like, I'm like, don't, I, I would never be so ignorant. I, I, I can't call myself Torah observant. I can't do 200 or the temple. 200 or that uh, uh, the priesthood, a bunch more for women. Like I can do a hundred something. I don't, I've, I've never read one sixth of a book and said, I've read the book. Uh, you know, <laughs> I've never studied one sixth of something and said, I did it all. So I'm not going to keep a hundred commandments and say, I kept six thirteen. I said, I am, I am just pursuant. I am fervently, passionately pursuing what is applicable to me. And that's it. So, uh, <laughs> in that state of things, it's, it's important to recognize that, you know, a lot of people, I know a lot of people gloat. Well, I observe Torah. So I'm better than the Christians. You know, Christians have hospitals. I've never seen a Messianic or Hebrew roots hospital. You know, the Christians beat red cross to Haiti when an earthquake ripped it into, I didn't hear Messianics going. I see Christian uh, youth group programs go and pick up garbage off the side of the street. Christians, they go and they visit the people in the, in the, in the prisons while we argue about calendars you gotta be kidding me <laughs> like so like where's the light and the moment we walk in the light of yeshua and the light of the torah as commanded by the messiah we will be growing way faster than we are today but it's all about the destruction of the internal ego i we had to rebel against the church or the synagogue to get to where we are now but if we keep that rebellious nature, we're going to see 12 congregations in one town, which we see a lot in bigger cities. We see a lot of just small groups and they don't even come together on, on, the, on the holidays. Like we're commanded to come together on the holidays. And we don't do that because, well, these guys, yeah, I don't know, these guys light their Hanukkah left or right. We just can't, we do a left, we do a right to left. We, we can't see his seat seat was tied right over left. Oh yeah, I can't, I can't even, and these, the gefilte fish over here, these guys are too Jewish, these guys are not Jewish enough, these guys are too rabbinic, these guys are not rabbinic enough, and I'm like, that's, oh, just basket, 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 and that light is trying to pierce out, but if we understood what we have, the Yeshua, the Yeshua, the synagogue, the, the, my family, the Jews need desperately, and the Torah that the church needs so desperately, we have both. We should be more powerful, walking in more authority and more inspiring and encouraging than any Christian or Jew you would ever meet in your entire life. Amen. Okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. All right. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> well, how much time do you have, Michael? I have an appointment tomorrow at 10 a.m. Okay. Good to hear. All right. <laughs> I, I think that Daniel wanted to, wanted to say something earlier. You want to go ahead, Daniel? Carol's got me excited. Um, shalom Lekum. <laughs> shalom. I uh, I know some things about light myself. I'm kind of sciencey myself, and what you said about light refracting, uh, that's very. That is, you know, we try to slow things. I've never heard that before about light being slowed down makes the rainbow. That's, I mean, that's true. The refraction of light being slowed yeah. down makes the different colors um god uh, you know of course put the rainbow in the sky with noah when he uh after he flooded the earth he put he refracted the light he slowed the light down so noah could see the the rainbow and uh the promise of uh that god would never destroy the earth by flood again so that that is very interesting there's seven colors in a rainbow and there's seven days in the week it's just really interesting there was a rest there was a time for the arrest to take place and uh i just thought that was really interesting uh it came to my mind when you were talking about the rainbow mm -hmm. thing and then That's the perversion and then the perversion of the rainbow by the lgbt community is the distortion of light you know is, is a good example. the distortion of light yeah yes 
And uh, well, I, go ahead. I love that you brought. I love that you brought. I just wanted to uh, appreciate that. Um, I didn't put those two together. I mean, I put that they were perverting um, our Noahide covenant, but at the same time, and I and I know that the, essentially the perversion of perfect light is color, which is which is kind of fun <laughs> in itself. But I didn't put those together, so thank you for bringing that, surfacing that. No problem. There's, you said, uh, I think you said that red was the slowing down of the beginning of slowing down of light, correct? Yeah, that's why sunsets are going to be warm tones, because that's sun that is traveling around the earth and eventually hitting us before it dissipates. Mm. And then in the slowest is violet, I think, uh, on the spectrum. If that's uh, yeah. Yeah, you're right, because, yeah, violet's in between the blue and the and the red, so yeah. And an ultraviolet is a lower frequency than than what we can see with the human eyes. So if we could see ultraviolet, you at night, you wouldn't see a black sky. You'd probably see a very purple sky, a glowing purple sky, which would be crazy. We, we would probably, if we saw all the colors, we'd probably never sleep because it'd just be so cool. <laughs> <laughs> sort of like the Aurora Borealis effect over and over again correct picture 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 seeing that picture seeing that out your car window and you're trying to drive you know there's oh, that's um there's so much beauty there's so much beauty right in front of our eyes that god hasn't even allowed us to see yet even just ultraviolet infrared you know if you could you know someone's sitting on the couch they get up and their red butt print is still there because they used to be there you know there there is there's so many things that uh, that we haven't seen yet. You know, a lot of people say that humans only use 10% of our brain. That's, there, there's no scientific founding for that ever. Somebody made that up and people just kept saying it. We use a much larger percentage of our brain and we only use certain parts of our brain at certain times. The back and the bottom of our brain, the animal side, they say, the lizard brain. I don't like calling it the lizard brain because I'm not part lizard, but that's the evolutionist. But that part of my brain, that's telling my heart to beat, that's telling me to breathe, that's telling me to you know, do all these things without me thinking about it, right? The front of my brain is, is more of me figuring stuff out right now, you know, language and different things. But imagine if we used not just 100% of our brains, but 100% of our eyes. Wow. I wonder if that's what, what heaven is like. Well, we're using 100% of our eyes. The mantis shrimp which is the fastest creature ever made, ever created. And it sees more of the electromagnetic spectrum than anything ever. The mantis shrimp can clamp its uh, pinchers, I guess I'm gonna call it its claws so fast, it creates an explosion that is thousands of degrees underwater. In cold, dark water, it goes so fast, it creates light and explosion and it goes out and it stuns the fish around it so it can go bite their heads off and stuff like that. A shrimp, the most powerful and fastest and the, and, and, and the best vision animal on, in the world, it's like this big. It's a little shrimp. <laughs> when you look at it, God is hilarious. You know, God didn't give us big brain creatures half the ability he gave to a little shrimp. If you clapped your hands and created light and an explosion, we probably destroy all of humanity. You know, I, I know I, I've said some mean things being hungry. Being hungry. <laughs> you know, imagine if we could, uh, you know, blow someone's head off just by clapping. I, I thank God he hasn't given us the full potential that 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 is in existence. But maybe we only use maybe 20 percent of our eyes. And that's that's a crazy thing to think of in its own, like being of uh, high functioning autism. I can see, so the average female can see more colors than the average male, which is why women like to touch and feel and look at curtains more than men. <laughs> women, you know, when women go to pick a paint color, what about this, honey? It's gray. What about this? It's gray too. What about this? It's a little bit brown. Yeah, that's a gray, I guess. So women see more colors than the average man, male. And the majority of all colorblind people are male, right? So being high, with my high functioning autism, I actually see more colors than the average female. So I was a kitchen designer for 10 years and I would sit there and we'd look at the colors and a woman would say, I don't see the difference in these three colors. And I would see a vast difference, right? And the husband, 
would be sitting on the couch drinking a beer by now. He's like, just don't paint the cabinets white and I'm fine. Don't charge me a lot of money and I'm fine, right? So there are different levels of being able to see right now. I can see vibrations off of lights. It's very annoying. Uh, I can see vibrations and colors that emit from people and animals and plants. I can be pitch black and I can still walk around and I know where all the furniture is. I can just sense it. In a house I've never been in before, it can be pitch black and I can still see something, an outline of something. And that's part of my autism. And so there's, but picture if we could see much, much more, it would be crazy. It's like, if God sees all, he's seeing much more than a mantis shrimp. And God is peering through different dimensions. If we saw the battle of the angels and demons that were in our own homes as believers, we'd all be hiding under the table or the, <laughs> we'd all be hiding under our desks. There could be a demon right next to me right now that I'm not seeing being mm -hmm. choked out by an angel because he's trying to possess me so that I'll stop having this conversation with you guys and stop sharing the light. I don't know. If I saw this, I'd probably be freaked out. I, ah, right? We are, by not being able to see everything, we are actually being protected by, by the Almighty. Like, like Moses in the, in the cleft of the rock. He would have mm -hmm. died. Moshe would have died. God knocks out Abraham and makes it, God makes a covenant with himself. You remember that? He's like, Abraham, I'm making a covenant with you. Cut all these, mm -hmm. these, uh, these cows in half and we're going to walk through them and burn them and stuff. That sounds very pagan if you think about it. And then <laughs> Abraham's about to do it. God knocks him out and God does it himself. I believe God has visited this earth in the form of Yeshua dozens and dozens, dozen, uh, possibly uh, I almost said dungeons and dragons. I was right. Dozen, dozens and dozens of times before. I believe that it was Yeshua who walked through, made that covenant with Abraham. I believe mm -hmm. it was Yeshua's back that Moshe saw. Mm -hmm. In the Aramaic Targum, it doesn't say God created a ram. It says God became a ram mm -hmm. and his horns were caught in the thicket to be sacrificed on Isaac's behalf. Yeshua says, I am the bread of life. What is the bread of life? It's the manna that fell from heaven. Yeah. Yeshua has been here the whole time. It's just yeah. the first time he comes in a physical human form was 2000 years ago and everyone freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Yeshua is that light. He's that visible part of God. We can't see God. So God took a part that the human eye could see and he called it the light of the world. Yeshua. He is literally mm -hmm. the light of the world. Amen. Well, one quick thing, one last quick thing. I, I just realized something when you were talking about this, um, you know, Hanukkah, we came out of this festival. It's also called the Festival of Lights. But here's something. Yep. <laughs> season of Lights. Yep. Um, so it's cheesy. It was cheesy, but I had to use that mode today. Yeah. One interesting thing is that his name was Judah Maccabee. His first name was Judah. And Yeshua is called, in the end, the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. Mm -hmm. So... He returned the lion. He will return as the lion of the tribe of Judah. But we go into the next festival, and we're looking at Purim, which we have a bride mm -hmm. with Esther, who he becomes a bride. bride. And and then the rest of the the feast are about her wedding rehearsal for what's to be done in the Aloma Ba. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting. You have a bridegroom. Judah, the the lion of the tribe of Judah, and then you have the bride herself, represented by Esther here, and um, and then you have two different anti messiahs, Antiochus Epiphanes. Then you have the anti messiah yet again with um, Haman yep. and yep. Um, ne ne Nero as well. Yes, and Nero, yeah, it was just really interesting. We see a uh, the light and the darkness there and then we see the wedding rehearsal going on through it all you know I, I love that you brought this up and scripture says that yeshua will return looking for a bride and how does he know who's his bride and who's not his bride will have oil in her lamps why in the world will we put an oil in a lamp it's only one purpose mm -hmm. to, cr God, to God, create God. light to create he is going to be looking for his bride that has light that's it it's that simple i mean 
even as much as he's born and some shepherds know about it because they're following a light in the sky it's it's everywhere right so the 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 next day starts when there's no longer light outside that's that's the new day because and that's a symbol of all creation that the new day begins with nothing tohu vabohu right uh, Bishit, uh we see in the beginning in Bereshit, there was nothing and to, tohu vabohu means there was nothing and there was nothing inside the nothing it was really <laughs> it's really like a you know, whenever I come home, for some reason, my teenage boys think that my only purpose for leaving and coming home was to bring them back hamburgers or something. So they're like, when I come home, they what what kind of food did you bring us? Tohu fabohu. There's nothing in the nothing. However, there's old spaghetti in the fridge, right? So, there's, but it means there was nothing in the nothingness. It's like when you say Elohim, it is plural, but it doesn't mean gods. It means God of gods, the God within. He is he is the mighty gods. So when we have the nothing and then there's light, we see a baby. Uh, now, I don't agree. You know, a lot of people, for some reason, think a baby is only a human when they're outside the womb. But here's this interesting thing is that is when the baby is revealed to the light and light is revealed to the baby. However, when a sperm goes in an egg, there is a flash of light that is observable by uh, microscopes. So scientists have no idea why there's a flash of light when the sperm goes in the egg. I know, I know. That's because that's when the soul enters the human body. That's because when the sperm goes in an egg, it's a living being, it's a human. And when you pray, your pineal gland and around your pineal gland in the center of your brain emits light. There's another thing, it's it light is this expulsion of electrons. And if you look at electrons, they can quantumly entangle to another electron all throughout time and space. So we call them quantum computers. So how can you scientifically speak to a God through time and space simultaneously? Well, on the science side of things, you would say, well, you communicate through quantumly entangled electrons anywhere in the universe. Interesting that our brains literally light up during prayer and medication, med med medication, no, during medication, they told down being pray, prayer and meditation. Also, I'm going to say it in intimacy with your spouse. In intimacy with your spouse, the center of your brain lights up. There's a part of creation and procreation that is natural to the human. And it's like this turning on of our pineal gland, almost like a cell phone, where we can better hear from God. It's this beautiful thing that is switched on when the sperm goes in the egg. And whenever, and if that were to be true, then there'd be light. Moses comes down the mountain. His face was glowing. Yeshua comes down the mountain. His face, even his clothes are glowing. Every time we saw somebody traverse time and space and communicate with somebody else, it created light. The center of our brains light up when we pray. What a beautiful thing, because that light can also heal us. That light can bring communication. And if you, have you ever just talked to someone and you like you knew what they were going to say next? You know, or you you know someone so well. I have family members where where my um, my grandma and her sister, and my twin cousins too. It happens a lot. My mom's side of the family, the Sephardic side, is they'll have a dream and they'll both be across the country. They both have a dream and they're talking in the dream. They wake up and call each other and finish the conversation because they were dreaming and talking about the same thing in their dream. It's that communication that we can have um, with each other. And I'm not going to call it telepathy or any woo woo stuff. But there is, you know, Yeshua says to, uh, you know, Philip comes up and brings, um, who was it? Oh, no, it was Philip. So uh, someone brings up Philip to Yeshua and he goes, I know you. I saw you when you were under the fig tree. What? Surely you are the Messiah, right? So under the fig tree is a Hebraic idiom meaning studying Torah and praying. It means you're under the fig tree. It means you're being fed from the Torah and fed in prayer. So Yeshua, even in his earthly human flesh bag form, bag of bones form, somehow knew he had this mental connection to this guy that he had never met yet. But he already knew him, even though he didn't meet him, because he went beyond the physical into that realm. I think it's awesome. I had a friend just a couple nights ago, he said, 
if if the father were to give me a he's going you have his bar mitzvah he's, he's coming from Roman Catholicism and he was in training to be a, a priest or a bishop he's trained to be a bishop in Catholicism training with at the Vatican and now he's coming to Torah and he said my bar mitzvah what do you think my Hebrew name would be and he's, bleh, Yaakov just came out Yaakov Jacob and he just starts laughing and I said what's that and he goes that's what I wrote down a week ago how did I know I, it, there was no hesitation. I knew that the father was giving him a Hebrew name of Yaakov, Jacob. I just knew. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to look through a list of Hebrew baby names. It was just existed in my mind because it existed in his mind and it existed in the father. It was just truth. That's all it was. And the more intimate we are with God is the more those things are going to happen in our lives. The more uh, prophecy is going to be very normal for us. The more chokmah, just powerful downloads of God's wisdom, the more that's going to be natural to us. The supernatural is the actual natural. This dumbed down state where we're in pain and we're in, uh, we're sick all the time and we're eating a terrible diet and we're depressed all the time. That's unnatural. This fear, anxiety, depression that we have in our culture, that is the real unnatural. Smiling on a Monday in a supermarket and having a lit up pineal gland, that's the actual natural. Sounds crazy, right? Like I, I'm the crazy one because I want to grow out, go out and grow my own food. I'm the crazy one. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> um, does anybody else have anything they want to they want to ask Michael? Okay. Well, there was a couple of things that I wanted to add. Um, you know, you're talking about uh, the, the growth of the of the Messianic and Torah pursuant community and some of the things we've been <laughs> lacking. <clears throat> and that is certainly true. Um, we have a long ways to go, but there are some people trying to do some things. Uh, there is a uh, an orphanage in India. I can't remember the name, but I think it's Hadassah something or other. Um, I think at the last revive conference, they had somebody there who was who was talking about it. Um, and there is a uh, uh, a man in Kenya who has a, a small orphanage that he's running. I don't know how to verify these people other than that people that I do know and respect vouch for them. So yeah. I can't I can't do much better than that. Um, but one that I do know a little bit more about is uh, T.J. Morris in Grindstone Ministries. Um, and he does uh, disaster response kind of stuff. Um, Love it. It's not explicitly a Torah ministry, but he is Torah observant and he runs this ministry. He also has a women's shelter that he started uh, or his family has started. He doesn't run it on his own. Um, so there are people out there who are really doing things that are practical and useful for the world. There's just not enough yet. We've got a long ways love, to go. I love it. But this is the beginning of life is just as powerful as everything else. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, TJ Morris and Grand Summit Ministries, I got to look them up. I got to be friends with these guys. So there's I love it because there is, uh, you know, life without action is just waiting to die. <laughs> and there's there's so many people out there handing out sandwiches and and doing orphanages and loving on people better than we are. Um, most of us, I would say, and at the same time, handing them a hand sa ham sandwich, literally leading them to sin, literally leading them to sin in the name of a sinless Messiah. And instead of me being upset about that, I am encouraged to make some turkey sandwiches. You know, I, I'm encouraged to to do more for me. And when people ask, I don't have to be rude about it. Well, I just eat what the Bible says. Oh, I don't have to. No, I just go, you know, I just first John two, six, you say you abide in him. You want walk his Christ walk. That's it. My rabbi mm -hmm. eats kosher. So I eat kosher. That's yeah, it. I want to live like he lived. So that's best it. I can do. The whole gospels in one verse live. I, I had uh, a good friend of mine and uh, uh, he translated that from Greek and it was even harsher. It's like, you have to, it's very, Greek is very black and white. You have to walk. You have to live a lifestyle exactly how he lived. It's very, very, it's very, very specific in Greek. And it's how did he live? 
Well, he was perfect at Torah. He upset some people, <laughs> but for the most part, people followed him because he was loving and healing, revealing he was a light. He's a light. That's it. And it's it's interesting, but this faith walk as Messianic believers couldn't be more simple. We 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 have stripped away a lot of the paganism that the church and, and even rabbinic Judaism has brought in. We've stripped away a lot of man's traditions. We've stripped away so much of the fat that we are down to this more of a pure meat. And we're still refining. We're still refining, figuring stuff out. But we're we're in a more pure faith. And it's not perfect. But we're we're in a more pure faith walk than than any church or synagogue or mosque or or than I could ever or parish that I could ever walk into, right? But at the same time, add the light to it. Wow. I just from this conversation, I am encouraged. I I I'm not focusing on the darkness of the world because it's always been there. It's gross. You know, I mean, I, I get it. Like for medical reasons, some people, it's going to be gross. Some people take a dump or they blow their nose and they stare at it for a second. You know, they blow your nose just to make sure it's not bloody or something. You know, whatever. I get it. You got to look at the toilet for a second, make sure everything's okay. Whatever. Please, if you're staring at it for over three hours, the problem's not the turd. The problem's you being a turd. So I, I can't focus. This is super gross, but we it's relatable. We, we can't focus on just the gross turdness of of Babylon, of, of the world, we're going to, we're, it's going to get in our brains. When I go to a congregation and I talk about Tammuz and Ishtar and, and, and Biden, you know, I'm throwing them in there, uh, more than they talk about Yeshua. Perfect. I, I know where their focus is. Their focus is on conspiracies and evil. And I go, Oh, please, please don't. Everyone's people are worried about the mark of the beast. What about the marks of the Lord? When's the last time you heard her teaching on the marks of the Lord? Mm -hmm. Because even in the, in the Shema and the Vahafta is to be a sign upon our hand. And it's frontlets between our eyes. If I already have the mark of the Lord on my hand and on my eyes, I have no room for the mark of the beast. I am so focused on the kingdom of God. I don't have time for the other guy. And the other guy loses anyways. Why would I give him any attention? I no longer give any validation to anything. A lot of people, and I'll, end, and I'll quit talking after this. I know a lot of people that go, how's your week? Oh, the devil's trying to get me down. Hasatani made me lose my job. I'm fighting with my kids. Why are you giving him credit? He's probably sitting on his dark throne in hell going, I don't even have to do anything. These guys give me credit for everything. Except for, you know, the father really taught me some lessons this week. The father really strengthened me in my conversation with my kids and really showed me that I'm not acting as the best parent. The father showed me that I didn't need that job. The father revealed to me with his light, good things the exact same thing could happen to two different people one person gives credit to the enemy one person person gives credit to god one person lives in the darkness and stays there and has excuses and is a victim of this of this life and one person is empowered and learns from those things and and spreads that light to other people even what is useful what is not that's what it comes down to light is the useful part of the electro now i'm not saying radio waves aren't useful i'm not saying microwaves aren't useful it's hard to make a, you know, it's hard to make popcorn by sh shining a flashlight on it. That's mm -hmm. the wrong frequency, right? <laughs> there are useful things outside of it, but the most useful is the revealing part. And our human eyes were specifically created by God to only see this specific range of the spectrum. Yeah, good point. Um, another quick comment. Um, don't anybody shoot me next time you see me in person. But I forgot to hit record until about 45 minutes in. I saw that. <laughs> so, um, but we did get a lot of good, good conversation on the recording anyways. And uh, one thing that we did not do early on, um, Michael, if, if you want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself and where you're coming from in your ministry and give your, uh, your ministry or your business or both uh, the URLs so people can find you. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rabbi Michael Schoening. So I'm um, ordained under the UMJA. You can look up UMJA. It's the uh, United Messianic Jewish Assemblies. Um, and then our congregation in Colorado Springs is called the Olive Tree Messianic Synagogue. And there's a lot of them called the Olive Tree. I found that afterwards. But uh, the Olive Tree Messianics um, .com or .org. I think it's .com. The Olive Tree Messianics .com, I believe it is. 
check.org is our website. We have different things that we, uh, uh, we have really good. I wish people, a lot of people would copy and paste. We have really good frequently asked questions of why we do what we do. Um, we are rebuilding the um, Dean of Faculty for the uh, Yeshiva Torah Institute. We are state accredited in Colorado to the doctorate's level. It's been in binders since 2008 and the rabbi taught it in person. I am now, um, we're making everything online. And personally, I think it's one of the biggest things we needed as our movement is formal education and not just formal, but affordable education. I've seen affordable and really bad stuff. We, like I said, we're state accredited. We can um, associates, bachelors, masters, and doctorates. And you're gonna be able to take all of this, you'll be able to get your doctorates on your phone on your time in a modular type system. You don't have to take certain credits per semester, anything like that. We're just gonna mass upload all of the curriculum and then you take what you can when you can. Take 20 years to get your doctorates, nice. take two years, I don't, I don't care. Um, so I'm super excited, super excited for that. We're gonna have lots of different teachers as well on that. Through the Olive Tree Synagogue, we also have bar mitzvah program, Hebrew classes, and a Lamed course. A Lamed course is a little more like a prerequisite. Uh, we have a lot of pastors go through this course that are uh, uh, Torah curious, right? They're Christians, but they're Torah curious. We call them bi-curious, just to make fun of them. And they and then they choose if they want to live a Torah pursuant life after that or not. Usually, yes. So those are things I'm involved with. The Yeshiva Torah Institute does not have a new website right now. I will be announcing on my Facebook and all the platforms when it's available, but um, formal education for the Messianic movement is my big push. We have hundreds of congregations in the Philippines with leaders with very little understanding and knowledge. And so they are uh, competing against each other like crazy, like, like crazy all over the Philippines. So I'm hoping to actually, once I launch the, the university, it's actually to fly into Milan and, um, and help some leaders that are already going to help um, actually personally help pay for it. Um, like I said, I want it to be affordable. Uh, on YouTube, you can look at the Olive Tree Messianic Synagogue. You're gonna find two of them with my face on it. One's my logo. I have two channels because I don't know how to merge YouTube channels. So there's two channels. One was a couple years of, of sermons, of Drosh sermons. And then the more recent one has a lot more, I think a couple hundred videos and uh, there's some really, really good stuff on there. Um, Hanukkah last year, the last two years, I talked about a light to the world. So my Hanukkah teaching actually covers the first half of this video that we missed, we weren't able to record. That's actually, most of what I said is already recorded on YouTube. So praise God for that. <laughs> but um, other than that, I have a book called The Unwind for Stressed Out Entrepreneurs. I sell digital copies of this for 10 bucks. Anybody can get a hold of me anytime. I am a life coach. I've got over 60 certs and licenses and work with people in trauma. So I'm a trauma recovery specialist as well as a, a therapeutic and active foster parent. Um, I don't remember what else I do. I'm an award-winning international speaker, published author, blah, 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 blah. The, the most important thing about the stuff that I am is the uh, stuff that I do is the stuff that I am. And I work with people and help them through life and help them be more of a light and find light in their life. Uh, that's a, through a lot of psychological means, a lot of mental health means. Um, and also I've, I'm an entrepreneur. We've started several successful businesses. And so a lot of people come to me and say, how do I run a business and be Torah person, uh, be messianic. And so I actually work with people specifically on how to obey God's commandments and be successful in business. One should never sacrifice the other and also the balance of your home life, right? There needs to be, it's not balance, it's boundaries. So I work with a lot of people in starting businesses and uh, that's very, very important to me because I believe that we are, um, we are made to be much more authoritative, authoritative and influential as a people than we are. I don't know how many people lost their jobs because they won't work Shabbat, but they don't feel equipped to start their own business. But if they did, they can employ 10, maybe hundreds of other people who also lost their job because they wouldn't work on Shabbat. So that's part mm -hmm. of being a tribe. Um, I don't, I don't get, I don't get hung up on the menial beliefs of people, name pronunciation, blah, blah. I don't care about any of that stuff. You call him Jesus, you call him Yeshua, Yoshua. I don't care. I don't think he cares either. Um, being a light is very, very important to me. So those things I do, I'm on a ministry sabbatical right now for the next five months. So I'm rebuilding the yeshiva. I'm not preaching at the synagogue right now. 
Um, I'd like to be travel a little bit in the next uh, few months if I could. I'm part of the Messiah meetings, which is uh, teachers from several different congregations, and we travel the country every few months and speak somewhere. And uh, we haven't done that in the last six months, but we do a lot of Texas, Florida. So I travel maybe five, six times a year and speak all over the country. So if people want me to speak um, at there and they want to gather something and we want to speak uh, locally and draw some people to your congregation, I'm happy to do that. Um, that's about it. That's all I can think of. So uh, uh, that's that's what I do and what I can do for people. People can get a hold of me on Facebook. As well. Okay, great. Outstanding. Any uh, any last comments from anybody before we close out? Just want to say thank you uh, to Rabbi Michael. Uh, he is he has been a light tonight, and I just appreciate. I'm sure everybody else appreciates it. He's been uh, instrumental in showing us things, and and uh, just very grateful for the light in him and that God shines. And just very grateful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. I see see that. Yep. Thank you for being here, everybody. I really appreciate your input, your participation. And uh, I will get the recording, that which it is, um, uh, uploaded. And uh, I'll put some links to uh, Rabbi Michael's uh, uh, ministries in the comments or in the uh, the video description that'll be on YouTube and Rumble, and there will be a link within the Common Sense Bible Study community. Um, Perfect. Uh, Paul is talking to me. Sorry, I can barely hear her, but it's all right. <clears throat> and if anybody's totally insane, I'm actually working with the local government here. Sixty-five percent or so of Colorado is owned by the Bureau of Land Management and is for sale by the federal government. So this is one of the fastest growing areas in America, where I live, Northeast Colorado Springs. We're going to surpass a million in the next couple of years, just this little town. But there are still areas for sale. So with enough people, um, I'd like to purchase from the federal government a plot of land and create a Messianic Torah community. Um, similar to the Moshavim in Israel, not the kibbutz. Uh, you know, the kibbutz, you can't have your own bank account. You can't, have, have your own, you can't own anything. In a Moshav, you can own and have your own little plot. But we farm together. You can have your own little garden too. And we create a community just like the first original 13 colonies were made in this exact same format. I've already got a lot of the laws and regulations written out. And then we deputize a few people and we have a legal, eventually fully sustainable off-grid Torah-based community here in, uh, in Southern Colorado. And then I'd like to every five years open a new one all over the country and start farming and trading internally so that we are taking care of each other as the greater tribe of Israel in this country. So is, this is, is very common in, in Israel, um, these kinds of communities. And the only reason we don't do it here is because we love the American dream and our white picket fences and my stuff, not your stuff. But that is ending. Acts chapter 2, 24 on is we shared stuff. We loved on each other. We grew food. We took care of each other. That mm -hmm. tribal family community, um, I'd like to see that. And every uh, I would like every state to have one of these Moshe, the Messianic Moshe. I've heard of a lot of interest in something like that from a lot of people. And the big barrier I've seen is that people just can't get along with each other long enough to make it work. No, it, no I, I totally agree. And that's where the rules and regulations come in. Um, I studied cults because I didn't want to become a cult. The number one thing in a cult is to have one guy running the show. Yeah, I will, not, I will not have that. I yeah. will not have that. A board, a board of elders, that is an odd number. At my synagogue, I can be outvoted. I'm on a, I didn't ask to be on a six month sabbatical. They said, you need that. We love you. We'll pay you still. Just go away for six months and, and, and just be who you are and we'll see in six months refresh it's perfect I, I i am outvoted my own synagogue and i love it i can't be a narcissist even if i wanted to be and then do and then uh cults have the purpose of exploiting people monetarily emotionally or sexually we have all of that in the uh in the laws that that's not what we're doing it's literally a small town of just people uh, we have little stores we have an infirmary we have a home school I have licensed teachers. Uh, we could have the yeshiva there and have the actual university. Um, in the state of Colorado, all of this can be owned by a nonprofit, tax-free. 
So pretty exciting. I've been working on this for seven years. There's a lot more to work on. Um, in southern, southern Missouri, they have they have now, it's, I think it's well over 1,500 to 2,000 people already living in these types of communities. Oh. So I was supposed to visit and then my trip got canceled in the fall for that, unfortunately. But um, Jim Staley's out there. A lot of people are out there forming these communities all over America. And they are getting along. They're hmm. getting along. They're, they're worshiping together. I'm from Oregon. Maybe I've just got that hippie blood still in me, that kombucha blood, but it's it's possible. Um, and you just create boundaries. You create boundaries. If somebody is 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 walking outside of Torah and it's agreed on by the Beit Din the, and the elders of the community, I'm sorry, but you got to move out. You know, it's just simply put. And you have people moving in the outskirts, which are in the Torah we call the refugee cities. And they're there for a year. And if they fit in the community, then they get to move into a, they get to purchase a home inside the town. They can only rent for the first year. We have these systems that we've been working on for a very, very long time. And uh, if anybody is crazy enough to join me in this, uh, we can actually create a town here in, in Eastern, East of Colorado Springs. Great. That sounds like a massive undertaking. I'm, but I'm excited for it. Cool. This is the, this is the weird stuff I do. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, Michael. Really appreciate, appreciate your you, time and uh, yeah, be blessed anytime. everyone. And for those of you who want to join us Thursday night, we'll be, uh, we'll be talking about Proverbs 11 Thursday night. So see you then. All right. Shalom. Shalom. Night, Shalom.